Okay, so we've been talking about different strokes and lesions, and I want to delve a little bit deeper into our discussion of hemorrhages by talking about intracranial bleeds starting with epidural hematomas. And essentially, an epidural hematoma is a collection of blood between the dura and the skull. Most are caused by disruptions of the middle meningeal artery, usually due to some type of fracture of the temporal bone by head trauma. Epidural hematomas are characterized by lucid intervals of several hours. Eventually, the hematoma begins to compress the brain, leading to elevated intracranial pressure and transtentorial herniation. What would you expect to see on a CT? Well, you would see a hematoma that is, looks something like a bioconvex disc. And this happens because the blood is limited by the strong dural suture lines. You can see the football-shaped lesion. I like to think of this as a football player thing. That's like my mnemonic. So here's your football lesion. And if you think about what the actual hematoma is caused by, it's caused by head trauma. So maybe you want to think about a football player like Richard Sherman having head-to-head -head contact with Michael Crabtree and it leads to this hematoma that also looks football-shaped, right? This is really the hallmark of epidural hematoma. So if you see that on an exam, just remember the football players and that'll let you know where it's caused. Head-to-head -head contact to the temporal lobe causing this football-shaped lesion. Subdural hematomas occur in the potential space between the dura and the arachnoid layers. What causes subdurals? They are usually caused by a rupture of the bridging veins after a trauma. The people who are most susceptible to developing subdural hematomas are the elderly because they often have diffuse cerebral atrophy that allows the brain to move more freely in the skull. This leads to injury of the veins. Shaken babies, alcoholics, and those with brain contusions are also at risk. So if we think about our skull here, then, you know, we have our brain and then you have the dura. Bridging veins essentially are veins that are coming through the dura. And so when you have any sort of movement that shifts the skull in this way, the brain in this way, you can rupture these veins and they bleed into the subdural space. Subdurals can be chronic, developing over the course of several weeks, or they can be acute, developing immediately after injury. Now, what would you see on a CT that would let you know this was a subdural hematoma? Subdurals are characterized by a crescent-shaped collection of blood, causing mass effect because the blood flows relatively freely between the two layers. Now, acute subdurals are hyper-intense when compared to brain tissue, but chronic subdurals can be either iso-intense or hypo-intense, depending on the stage of blood clotting. So, in this image, are we viewing an acute or chronic lesion? So, this would be a chronic lesion because it is hypo-intense. There's generally a midline shift due to the mass effect of blood pushing everything to the other side. But in contrast to epidurals, these cannot cross the falx or tentorium. A subarachnoid hemorrhage occurs in the space between the arachnoid and the PO layer, which contains the major blood vessels of the brain. What causes subarachnoids? Hemorrhage occurs when an aneurysm or an AVM ruptures. Risk factors for aneurysm development that we already mentioned include polycystic disease, Marfan's, hypertension, smoking, and there are a few more. What is the chief complaint of a patient with a subarachnoid hemorrhage? The classic description that you get is the worst headache of my life. You should particularly worry when it's of sudden onset. They usually can remember exactly when it started. They may also have meningeal signs like nuchal rigidity or photophobia. On CT, you may be able to appreciate hyperdense blood. This image shows blood filling the star-shaped supercellar cisterna. Now, what's the most accurate way to diagnose a subarachnoid hemorrhage? The gold standard for diagnosis is a lumbar tap that would show either blood or xanthochromasia. Xanthochromasia is basically just the yellowish color in the lumbar tap that you'd see due to breakdown products of the blood.
Once you've treated these patients acutely, they should be started on a calcium channel blocker to reduce the risk of arterial vasospasm because this can lead to cerebral ischemia or infarction. This is a favorite farm question for board riders, so you should make sure you remember this. Calcium channel blocker for patients that have been treated for subarachnoid hemorrhage. A parenchymal hemorrhage is most often caused by hypertension, though amyloid angiopathy and certain toxic metabolic causes are occasionally at fault. Now, small vessels are affected, such as the lenticulostriate arteries, and these hemorrhages are most common in the basal ganglia and internal capsule. Now, here we can see the lesion, and just as in subdural hematomas, the fact that it is hyperintense when compared to brain matter tells us that it is an acute lesion. The CT of an intraparenchymal hemorrhage shows a rounded area with contrast enhancement as seen here. Ischemic brain infarctions occur usually in the context of cardiovascular disease. There is decreased brain perfusion, which causes irreversible damage after about five minutes. Now, what are the most vulnerable areas in the brain? These are the hippocampus, the neocortex, cerebellum, and all the watershed zones. The reaction of the brain to an ischemic insult is the same as the pathogenesis for all brain remodeling after injury. This table outlines the general time course of neuronal injury and response. The process begins with red neurons, or neurons undergoing cell death. This then leads to an immune response of neutrophils, followed by macrophages, and lastly, it ends with gliosis and scarring. And it is important to know this time course, so you should spend some time remembering how long each of these phases in the recovery response are. One major cause of ischemic brain disease is atherosclerosis. Thrombi can break off of a plaque at the common carotid artery and lodge into a subsequent smaller artery. If blood flow is blocked significantly, it leads to a stroke. The classic cause of ischemic stroke is atrial fibrillation, which is why all these patients are on anticoagulants. But any valvular problem or structural heart defect allowing right-to-left shunting can precipitate emboli. Think about the different ways for blood clots to get to the brain. An infective valve can shoot off emboli to the brain. A deep vein thrombosis can travel through a patent foramen or valley to the left heart and travel to the brain. Now, what is the treatment for ischemic stroke? The treatment for ischemic stroke is to give TPA, but this is only if the onset of symptoms occurred within three to four hours. After 4.5 hours, the risk of an intracranial bleed with TPA outweighs the possible benefits. You should definitely remember that time course. Hemorrhagic stroke is included here because it is a common sequela of ischemic brain injury. You can think of it this way. When an area is ischemic, the blood vessels in that region become fragile and less able to do their job. Thus, they're extremely vulnerable to increases in pressure. And that is what will lead to the hemorrhagic stroke. If you didn't get, this is my animation of blood squirting out of a vessel. A temporary ischemic attack, or TIA, is a temporary brain ischemia, usually causing focal neurologic deficits that last about 10 minutes. Some can last longer, but by definition, they should all resolve within 24 hours, or else it is actually a stroke. These patients get a full workup to search for treatable sources of emboli, but generally they are just prescribed low-dose aspirin. Now, if you get a question with a vignette and the description of the symptoms leads you to think the patient is having a stroke, but then miraculously, they get better in a short space of time, unfortunately, in this situation, it wasn't a miracle. The answer is TIA. You can see ischemic brain injury on CT after 24 hours or MRI within 30 minutes. Now, the real reason to do this is so that you can rule out hemorrhagic stroke in order to safely give what drug? TPA. The dural venous sinuses are where the venous blood runs and also where CSF is resorbed. The detailed anatomy is not really that high yield for the exam. However, you should recognize that all sinuses eventually drain into the internal jugular vein. CSF flows into arachnoid granulations where it can exit the subarachnoid space and enter the bloodstream.
The most important sinus to know is the cavernous sinus. It's important because of the important structures that run through it. That includes cranial nerve 3, 4, 5, 1, 5, 2. Those are just the different divisions of the fifth cranial nerve. And then cranial nerve 6, the abducens nerve. Cavernous sinus thrombosis, where blood is blocked from flowing through the cavernous sinus, can lead to headache as well as cranial nerve deficits. Sagittal sinus thrombosis is caused by hypercoagulable disorders, especially in pregnant women. These patients present with seizures, headaches, and strokes. Now, why do you think this is? Well, this is due to increased intracranial pressure that accumulates due to blockage of the primary path through which fluid must exit the brain. The ventricular system is where the CSF is made and flows. The CSF is made by the choroid plexus cells which line the lateral ventricles. It is then resorbed through the arachnoid granulations which we discussed into the venous sinus system, which is what we just mentioned. There is one lateral ventricle in each hemisphere that drains to the midline third ventricle and fourth ventricle. What is the path by which the lateral ventricle drains into the third ventricle? This would be the foramen of Monroe, which is seen right there. And what is the path by which the third ventricle drains into the fourth ventricle? That is the cerebral aqueduct. The fourth ventricle has three outflow tracts, the pied foramen of Lushka, which are the two lateral outflow tracts, and the foramen of Magendie, which is the medial outflow tract. You can remember this with the mnemonic that L in Lushka stands for lateral and M in Magendie stands for medial. Alright, time for a flash quiz. Which cranial nerves run through the cavernous sinus? The answer is cranial nerves 3, 4, V1, V2, and 6. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension is exactly what its name implies. Idiopathic refers to the fact that there is an unknown cause for this disorder, while intracranial and hypertension obviously refer to the fact that there is increased pressure in the brain. Now this disorder occurs in the absence of a tumor or other diseases. The main symptoms are headaches, nausea and vomiting, double vision, as well as other visual symptoms. These are all symptoms that one would expect to see with increased intracranial pressure. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension can also be known as pseudotumor cerebri and can only be diagnosed if there is no alternative explanation for the symptoms. One clinical sign that is indicative of the intracranial hypertension seen in this disease is papilledema, as seen in this image. There are some risk factors that you should be aware of as well. These include the use of danazol, obesity, being a woman of childbearing age, and what vitamin excess. The answer is vitamin A excess. Treatment usually includes acetazolamide and topiramate. However, in refractory cases, more invasive procedures such as shunt placements might be performed to lower the intracranial pressure. Now on the board exam, the way this is likely to show up is in a question involving an obese young woman who has some clinical evidence of increased intracranial pressure but no other clinical history to point to a specific diagnosis. Hydrocephalus is known as water in the head, and it is caused by increased CSF in the intracranial cavity, which leads to mass effect. There are four types of hydrocephalus, normal pressure hydrocephalus, communicating hydrocephalus, non-communicating hydrocephalus, and hydrocephalus ex vacuo. This picture is an example of a severe case of hydrocephalus. Communicating hydrocephalus is caused by impaired CSF resorption at the arachnoid granulations or excessive CSF production. There is no obstruction within the ventricular system itself, hence everything communicates.
This will often lead to an increase in intracranial pressure that can manifest as papilledema or herniation. One way this could show up on the test is in the clinical scenario of a patient that has recently recovered from meningitis. This is because meningitis can lead to scarring of the arachnoid granulations which would impair their ability to reabsorb CSF. NPH or normal pressure hydrocephalus is commonly seen in the elderly. It is a particular type of communicating hydrocephalus. The ventricles are abnormally dilated, but the CSF pressure is not elevated, hence the name. This is thought to be due to impaired CSF reabsorption at the arachnoid granulations. Patients present with a classic triad of symptoms. What are they? Urinary incontinence, gait ataxia, and dementia, which you may remember as wet, wobbly, and wacky. That's the mnemonic for it. It is important to diagnose as it is a reversible cause of dementia in the elderly. Non-communicating hydrocephalus is caused by an obstruction of flow within the CSF system. In this non-contrast head CT, we see drastically enlarged lateral ventricles as a result of obstructed CSF flow, and this flow is blocked secondary to a supracellar cyst. One common place for the obstruction is at the aqueduct of Sylvius. The sort of dilation seen here leads to a mass effect that can cause a number of different symptoms. They include headache, nausea and vomiting, cognitive decline, altered mental status, papilledema, and a cranial nerve 6 palsy. Patients may also have a magnetic gait where the feet shuffle along the floor. Hydrocephalus ex vacuo occurs in areas of previous brain damage. Essentially, the brain tissue is resorbed and filled in with CSF. It is not symptomatic. In this image, you see very dilated lateral ventricles. You might also notice the extensive cortical atrophy. Now, in what disease that affects elderly patients would you see cortical atrophy as well as hydrocephalus ex vacua? Well, you would see this in Alzheimer's. Look out for a patient with progressive cognitive decline that also has hydrocephalus on imaging.